In this video, I'll give a brief overview of the ultrasound wave physics, piezoelectric pr properties of the crystals located in the probe, tissue acoustic impedance, and generation of image. I'll also briefly discuss the basics of key ultrasound modes that we need to be familiar with, such as B mode, M mode, color Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, and power Doppler imaging. In addition, I'll also go over uh, the characteristics of a normal renal sonogram and the three most common sonographic pathologies that we encounter, that is hydronephrosis, stone, and cyst. Sound is a vibration that is transmitted in a medium, example air, that can be heard by human ear. All vibrations, including sound, have a frequency. Frequency is a measure of how often something vibrates per second and it's measured in hertz. The human ear can hear between frequencies of about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, this is what we humans hear and sounds with frequency of less than 20 hertz are called infrasound and animals like elephants and giraffes use infrasound to communicate among themselves and sounds more than 20,000 hertz are called ultrasound and bats use uh, ultrasound to find their prey and dolphins use to communicate among themselves. In spite by the success of radar during World War II an Austrian neurologist called Karl Dusik uh, was probably the first to apply ultrasound to medical diagnosis in early 1940s. The picture on the left here is the first diagnostic ultrasound image of a living human being ever recorded by Carl Dusik in 1947. This is actually lateral view of Dusik's head and the white area represents high degree of attenuation because of reflection from the skull. And this middle black portion right here probably represents Dusik's lateral ventricle. And this picture was shown by Dr. Dusik at the meeting at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York in 1951. And the right picture here represents uh, the ultrasound machine he designed. The basic principle of ultrasonography is piezoelectric effect. The word piezoelectricity means generating electricity by applying pressure or conversion of mechanical energy into electrical energy. The opposite is called reverse piezoelectric effect. The crystals in the ultrasound transducer exhibit both these properties. The first picture here shows that application of electrical field to these piezoelectric crystals in the probe generate ultrasound waves. And these ultrasound waves go and uh, hit the target organ. Now the target organ creates echoes and the resultant echo will now make these crystals generate electrical impulses, which are converted into image format by the ultrasound machine. So other important principle that helps us understanding image orientation on the screen is that echoes from the organs that are close to the transducer take less time to reach back to the machine and appear on the top of the screen. And on the other hand, echoes from the organs that are located farther from the probe take long time to reach back to the probe and they appear on the bottom of the screen. In this example, liver is on top of the screen and kidney is on the bottom of the screen because liver is closer to the transducer when you are scanning from the anterior or the lateral aspect. Angle of insonation is another concept which is defined as the angle of the ultrasound beam related to the organ of interest. You get strong echoes which means better picture when the angle of incidence approaches the angle of reflection, which happens when the beam is perpendicular to the surface. For example, when you image transverse section of iota, the anterior and posterior walls, which are perpendicular to the beam, can be seen more clearly than the side walls, which are parallel to the beam. But at the same time, it's important to note that for Doppler ultrasound, angle of insonation should be parallel at least less than 60 degrees to obtain best images, not perpendicular, like for the regular grayscale ultrasound. This becomes important when you are doing duplex ultrasound of the renal artery. The picture shown here is the console of the GE ultrasound machine we use. Um, whatever machine you are using, you should be able to locate a few important modes and controls. For example, here B is the brightness mode, M is the motion mode, CF is the color flow Doppler, PW is the pulse wave Doppler, PDI is power Doppler imaging, and you also want to know how to adjust the gain or brightness of the image. Here we, we roll this thing uh, surrounding the B mode, and 
and you also want to know how to control the depth of the image and how to freeze the image and save it. B mode is the universal imaging mode, which is nothing but the usual two-dimensional grayscale image we see like this one. And the image is made up of several dots and the brightness of each dot is determined by the amplitude of the return echo signal. Just in case you are wondering, there are 256 shades of gray, not 50. M mode or motion mode is used to measure the dimensions of a moving structure and it represents motion over time. When you turn on this mode, you get a line like this, like the vertical line like this, uh, which you place in the area of interest and uh, then it measures the movement of that area over a period of time. In this example, we are measuring the changes of diameter of inferior vena cava with respiration. So all this area is representation of just whatever is behind this line over a period of time. Depth controls the distance over which the B mode images um, the organs. For example, as shown here, if you care only about the liver and the kidney and nothing else, decrease the depth. And if you want to see deeper structures, increase the depth. Gain is the ultrasound term for brightness of the image and increases or decreases the amount of echo information that is displayed on the image. You don't need to adjust it every time um, you image an organ unless the room is too dark or too bright. Time gain compensation is the function that alters the signal intensity or brightness at various depths. You use when you want to change the gain at a particular depth of the image and rest of the image is optimal. For example, in this video of, of the bladder, uh, the, this part of the image on top is optimal, but the bottom part is too bright. If you want to change the brightness of only of the bottom part of this image, you change these buttons right here. You move only lower two or three buttons to the left and then the brightness of that particular part of the image is adjusted. So essentially you use time gain compensation when you don't want to alter the gain or brightness of the entire image, but just a part of it. Doppler ultrasonography is used to detect blood flow and is based upon changes in the frequency of the reflected signal from small moving structures, such as red blood cells uh, that are intercepted by the ultrasound beam. If the object is stationary, like here, say if the red blood cell or the object is not moving, the reflected frequency is pretty much similar to that of transmitted frequency. But if the object is moving towards the transducer, the reflected frequency is higher than the transmitted frequency. And that is represented on the screen as red color. And if the object or the RBC is moving away from the probe, the reflected frequency is lesser than the transmitted frequency and that is reflected on the screen as blue color. So essentially, red and blue represent direction of blood flow but need not necessarily indicate artery or vein. And Doppler shift is the difference between transmitted and reflected frequencies and it is maximally detected when the angle of insonation is parallel to the vessel as opposed to grayscale imaging uh, where we already discussed that the perpendicular angle produces better images. Power Doppler is used to detect flow like the regular color Doppler but it uses intensity of the return signal rather than the frequency. Depending on the intensity of the echoes, it is brighter and lighter at places instead of instead of the color coding that we have, such as blue and red. It's usually of the same color, but darker and lighter. So it is more sensitive for vessels with low blood speeds. We don't use it routinely in kidney ultrasound, but you may use it to detect ureteral jets when you are imaging bladder, like you, it is shown here. So ureteral jets are uh, the intravesical urine ejaculation owing to the pumping effects of calicial peristalsis. They're used to rule out or rule in obstructive uropathy is controversial, but they definitely look pretty and are fun to watch. Pulsed wave Doppler. In this mode, ultrasound probe sends out a signal uh, to a certain depth and then stays quiet and just listen to the reflected frequency shift from the particular depth. It is used to accurately measure the velocity of blood in a precise location and in real time. 
This is the mode we use to calculate renal resistive index. When you turn on this mode, you get a line with a small opening like this, and this opening is called Doppler gate. You take this gate to the vessel of interest. Here, the vessel is iota, and you'll get a graph consisting of systolic and diastolic velocities. Once you get a good tracing, freeze the image and measure peak systolic, that is at the top of this peak, and end diastolic, that is at the bottom of this uh, diastolic pulse, uh, to measure peak systolic and end diastolic velocities. And using that, you can calculate uh, resistive index. There is another mode called continuous wave Doppler, which allows us to measure blood velocities along the entire line of interrogation, not just at the Doppler gate. It requires a probe to continuously send out pulses of ultrasound along a line and continuously listen for the multitude of reflected frequency shifts that are coming back. It's used in echocardiography and uh, not very relevant to focus by nephrologists. Probe or the transducer is the part with which the machine talks and listens, which means it generates ultrasound signals and receives back the echoes. Probes have different frequencies. How do you select the right probe for your examination? High frequency ultrasound waves produce good resolution, but the depth of penetration is limited. So high frequency transducers are used to examine superficial structures such as nerves and vessels where resolution is important. Low frequency sound waves, on the other hand, penetrate deeper, but at the cost of resolution. So lower frequency transducers are used to image deeper structures such as kidney. However, the resolution you get is enough to image the kidney because the range of pathologies that you see in the kidney are very limited and you don't miss any um, lesions just because the frequency of probe is lower. Now we will briefly talk about commonly used probes. First one is the curvilinear transducer which is a low frequency probe commonly used in abdominal sonography. It displays a wide fan shaped scanning area so you can get whole kidney in view together with liver or spleen. As the name suggests, it has a curved surface and the piezoelectric crystals are arranged in that shape. This is phased array transducer, commonly known as the cardiac probe because it's used for echocardiography. This is also a low frequency probe and it has a smaller footprint. Footprint is the surface of the probe that comes in contact with the body. Um, it helps us scan the heart through the intercostal spaces, avoiding rib shadow because it's so small um, at the place where it comes into contact with the body. And the piezoelectric crystals are arranged in the center of the probe, providing a pie-like scanning area which avoids rib shadows. This is the linear array trans transducer or the vascular probe, and it's a high-frequency probe and it provides detailed anatomic resolution, and it's ideal for evaluating superficial structures such as doing musculoskeletal or vascular ultrasound or thyroid ultrasound. This is the intracavitary probe. As the name suggests, it's used to scan uh, from within the cavities, and it is a high-frequency probe and offers good resolution, and uh, it is used to do transvaginal, transrectal, or oral scans three-dimensional and four-dimensional probe. So these are wideband curved transducers that are used to obtain 2D, 3D, and 4D images for abdominal obstetrics and gynecologic imaging. And you can get pretty pictures of babies using them. They're of less utility and more fun at this time, but they're likely to have a role in transplant renal ultrasound in the future to evaluate vascular anastomosis. One important thing to note is that the use of alcohol-based disinfectants, including 70% isopropyl alcohol, is not recommended for disinfection of transducers because they can potentially dry out and destroy the rubber head of the transducers. And warranty on your machine does not cover probe damage because of unapproved cleaners. So how to clean the probe then? So you should just refer to the machine's um, user manual for approved list of disinfectants and clinic products. And we commonly use ammonium chloride based wipes. And never drop the probe because drops are not covered under warranty. While describing the appearance of a structure on ultrasound image, it's important to note that the brightness of that structure is being described in relation to that of surrounding structures. And it is termed relative echogenicity. Remember, there are 256 shades of gray, and 100 shade is 
brighter than the 50th shade, but it is darker than the 200th shade. So for example, this circle right here is brighter or hyperechogenic compared to the surrounding area. And this circle here is darker or hypoechoic compared to the surrounding area. An example would be, uh, you're probably talking about cortex of the kidney as compared to liver, or you're talking about medullary pyramid in comparison to cortex. And here, here you, you can't even delineate the circle, so it's pretty much of same intensity as the surrounding structure, and it is called isoechoic. And this structure right here is black, and it is called anechoic. The example would be any fluid-filled thing, such as a cyst in the kidney. What determines how bright or dark each structure appears on an ultrasound image? It depends on the tissue acoustic impedance. Impedance means resistance, and this is how much resistance a tissue or a part of it offers to the passage of sound waves through it. For example, blood and clear fluids such as ascites and effusions allow most of the ultrasound waves to pass through them and hence appear black on the screen. And solid organs such as kidneys and liver reflect some ultrasound waves and transmit some waves, so they appear in different shades of gray. Fibrous structures such as diaphragm reflect most and transmit some ultrasound waves. They appear white on the screen. Air has low acoustic impedance, but still appears bright because randomly moving air molecules scatter sound waves and give dirty shadows. As you can see here in the example here is uh, of emphysematous pyronephritis in the kidney, where you can see bright air uh, with some dirty shadowing. Bone has very high acoustic impedance and does not allow any sound waves to pass through it and appears white. And posterior shadowing will be seen with the bones. We'll just see in a bit what it means. Acoustic shadowing. When a highly reflective structure such as bone or stone is in the pathway of sound waves, a shadow is seen behind it. This is pretty much similar to the shadows we create when we are in the pathway of light. Shadows are created by air also when uh, air molecules scatter sound waves, but these are disorganized because of the random movement and it's called dirty shadowing as opposed to clean and well-defined shadowing by stones and bones. Here is the example of dirty shadowing by bowel gas and here is a well-defined shadow produced by a gallstone. Acoustic enhancement is the opposite of shadowing and is seen with structures that are excellent transmitters of sound waves. When the ultrasound beam encounters a focal weakly attenuating structure or a good transmitter, such as cyst within the imaging field, the amplitude of the beam beyond this structure is greater than the surrounding area and is falsely displayed as increased echogenicity deep to the structure. Like this, here you are seeing black cysts and you see a white area here posterior to the cyst and that's because of acoustic enhancement. This is a useful artifact that helps you identify cysts. This can also occur with any localized fluid filled structure such as um, transfer section of blood vessels or any localized ascites collection or even the urinary bladder that we saw when we were discussing the time gain compensation. Why do we use gel to obtain ultrasound images? As we discussed before, air scatters the sound waves and even the tiny amount of air between the skin and the transducer can make the image unclear. So you need to use a substance between the skin and transducer whose acoustic impedance is similar to organs in the body. As most organs tend to have acoustic impedance closer to that of water, gel makes a good coupling medium and this matching of resistance is called impedance matching. Now we'll briefly discuss the anatomy of the kidney. So each kidney consists of an outer cortex and inner medulla. The renal cortex is a continuous band of pale tissue that is completely surrounding the medulla and medulla is organized into multiple triangular structures called pyramids. And extensions of the renal cortex project into the inner layer and these are called columns of Burton. It's important to notice this because sometimes these columns of Burton can hypertrophy and can mimic a mass. The apical portion of each pyramid 
or also called renal papilla is surrounded by a minor calyx and several minor calyces unite to form a major calyx and two or three major calyces unite to form the renal pelvis that is this funnel shaped top end of the ureter and the area surrounding the calyces is filled with fat like you see in this pathology picture here and that's called sinus fat and sinus fat is the brightest structure on the renal sonogram and uh, on the sonogram it's uh, easy to identify the kidney first of all because it's surrounded by a fibrous capsule that's why there is always a definition to the kidney unlike pancreas where you are identifying pancreas just based on its uh, uh, neighboring organs and vessels and cortex of the kidney is hypoechogenic compared to that of uh, liver or spleen or sometimes isoechoic and uh, medullary pyramids are anechoic most of the times especially when the patient is well hydrated or sometimes they can be just hypoechoic compared to that of cortex and as i said before fat is the brightest or hyperechoic structure in you see on the kidney ultrasound and the collecting system here is hypoechoic and pretty much similar to cortex in echogenicity and remember collecting system is not black unless there is urine backflow that is hydronephrosis you cannot usually see uh, ureters unless uh, they are dilated with urine next thing is the image orientation on the ultrasound screen so this is one thing that beginners tend to struggle with this is what part of the image is superior inferior anterior posterior etc but this becomes very easy if you know two things first is which part of the image is closer to the probe and second thing is where is the probe marker pointing towards as we already discussed the structure that is closer to the probe appears on top of the screen and the structure that is farther from the probe appears at the bottom of the screen so if you are imaging kidney from the lateral aspect through the liver liver is on the top of the screen because it's closer to the probe and while performing abdominal scan by convention the probe marker should always point towards patient's head when you are do, obtaining longitudinal images and to the patient's right when you are obtaining transverse images there will be an indicator on the screen corresponding to the probe marker and therefore the side with the indicator on the screen is either superior or right or lateral depending on the plane of imaging here in this longitudinal section of the kidney the top portion is lateral aspect of the kidney because it's closer to the probe assuming we are imaging from the lateral aspect of the body uh, it could be anterior also if you are imaging it from the front and the renal pelvis area is medial and the probe marker corresponds to this indicator on the screen and in the longitudinal section you are always pointing your probe marker towards patient's head so this part of the kidney is superior and the opposite is inferior so if you find a cyst or stone here you say you found a cyst or stone in the superior pole of the kidney and in the transverse section of the kidney you can see the liver on the top uh, because it's closer to the probe again and remember liver covers both lateral and anterior aspects as you will point uh, the probe marker towards patient's right while obtaining the transverse images the side of the image with indicator here is right and the opposite side is the left there are two important neighbors of the kidney that is liver on the right and spleen on the left these organs also act as acoustic windows for the kidneys that is we look at kidneys through these organs that means we look at the right kidney through the liver because you are putting your probe here on the body and the left kidney you will look through the spleen and on the right liver extends more anteriorly so the right can, kidney can be visualized easily through anterior or lateral imaging planes on the left spleen is more lateral and if you go more anterior you will encounter bowel gas so left kidney is better um, visualized through the lateral aspect in this images here uh, on the right side of the screen you can orient yourself better now after knowing all this so this is the longitudinal section of uh, the right kidney here 
and you are visualizing right kidney through the liver so this is liver and liver is closer to the probe because you are either imaging from the lateral aspect or the anterior aspect so the part that is closer to the probe is displayed on the top of the screen and the probe marker here as you will point your probe marker towards patient's head when you're obtaining longitudinal images. So this must be towards patient's head, that is cephalot, and the other part is the cordard. And uh, here you see this uh, whitish structure here, so this is diaphragm, and above, whatever is above the diaphragm is the patient's lung. And similarly, left kidney, you're seeing spleen, that is closer to the probe, this is towards head, this is towards patient's feet, and this is the fibrous diaphragm here, and anything above the diaphragm is lung. So kidney ultrasound is not complete unless you image the bladder, especially when you are looking for hydronephrosis. To obtain the sagittal and transverse views of the bladder, you hold the probe marker towards the patient's head and to the right, respectively, like we do for any other abdominal uh, organ imaging probe marker towards patient's head for sagittal view, towards right for the transverse view. And bladder is a well-defined structure uh, containing urine. So urine is fluid, so it appears black on the sonogram. And in sagittal section, bladder appears more or less triangular, and it's more rectangular in the transverse section. Remember, these appearances are with full bladder, and the shape can vary depending on the amount of urine you have in the bladder. And uh, if you have to visualize pelvic structures such as uterus or prostate um, uh, from the abdomen, uh, full bladder is necessary. But if you are doing a transvaginal ultrasound or transrectal ultrasound, then you ask the patient to um, empty the bladder. Now we will go over the three most common sonographic pathologies um, that we are looking for in a kidney ultrasound. The first one is hydronephrosis. And here in this image, as you can see, this is the normal kidney. Here is the kidney parenchyma with cortex and medulla, and here is the collecting system, renal pelvis, and ureter. If you closely observe, you see these minor calices. Uh, they form a concave shape here, where the renal papilla, or the tip of the renal pyramid, converges. So that's how a normal collecting system would appear. So in the mild hydronephrosis, there is some dilatation of the renal pelvis. And the architecture of the kidney otherwise is intact. So here is a mild hydronephrosis. Like I said, the collecting system is never black unless you have hydronephrosis. It's usually hypoechogenic and similar to that of cortex. So here you see a black thing that is urine backup uh, going inside the kidney, but overall the architecture is preserved. And moderate hydronephrosis is characterized by moderate dilatation of the renal pelvis. And uh, calyces will start blunting out, which means here they are concave and they start becoming convex here. And, and as the pressure builds up inside this collecting system, it extends deeper into the kidney. So now you might see slight blunting of uh, the medullary pyramids and they are not of triangular shape anymore uh, as the hydronephrosis progresses. So here is the example for moderate hydronephrosis. Your all renal pelvis is all black and distended. And here you can also see the proximal part of the ureter. And here you see more convex calyces. And sometimes these also are described as cauliflower appearance. And as it gets more severe, there will be gross dilatation of renal pelvis and the calyces. And essentially kidney becomes like a ball of uh, um, water and you lose all the corticomedullary differentiation and the cortex becomes very thin. This is the example of severe hydronephrosis where you are not able to see any pyramids and, and the cortex has thinned out. Stones appear as echogenic foci that are accompanied by acoustic shadowing. So acoustic shadowing, as we discussed earlier, that's an artifact that helps us to identify stones so that shadowing can be caused by any reflective surface but when you're looking in the kidney stone or some calcified structure is something that would reflect all the sound waves so that that's why it gives shadowing so in this picture these are reflective structures here followed by shadowing here you can you can measure the um, 
stone length using your measurement uh, calipers and you see shadowing posterior to the stones. And uh, ultrasound is not a sensitive test to identify ureteral and lower urinary tract stones. It is good to identify um, stones in the kidney parenchyma and hydronephrosis acts as a surrogate marker for ureteral stones. Twinkle artifact. So apart from shadowing, stones are associated with another useful artifact on Doppler ultrasound. That's called twinkle artifact. The twinkling occurs as a focus of alternating colors that mimics turbulent blood flow, like you see here. It's not the red or orange color um, that you see when the blood is moving towards the transducer. It's not the blue color that you're seeing um, when the blood is moving away from the transducer, but it's a mixture of colors as if there's a turbulent flow. And uh, it appears with or without an associated uh, color comet tail. Here you can see these like extensions, like the stone is here, and this extension uh, is called comet tail. So it can occur just here in this part of the stone, or it, it can occur in association with a tail. So it's called comet tail. And it's important to note that twinkle artifact is actually more sensitive for detection of small stones than is acoustic shadowing. It is highly dependent on the machine settings and is more pronounced when the reflecting surface is rough. According to a 2017 study, the twinkling artifact had a sensitivity and specificity of 99% and 91% respectively for identification of renal stones. I use this very frequently uh, when I'm not sure of shadowing. So it's always good to have uh, one Doppler image of the kidney uh, whether you see anything suspicious for stones or not, so that you can, when you're reviewing the um, saved images, that would always be uh, useful if you find a um, twinkle artifact. Here is another example for uh, twinkling artifact. Here you see refractile structures with uh, shadowing here uh, in this grayscale image. And shadowing is not probably very pronounced in, in some parts, but when you turn on the color Doppler, you see very nice twinkling with with long tails here with the comet tails so that way it will be really very useful to identify uh, multiple stones in the kidney especially when you are not really sure about the shadowing so next pathology is cyst cyst appears as a well-defined anechoic lesion with thin walls and uh, it appears anechoic because most of the time cysts contain clear fluid and they're accompanied by this uh, enhancement we call it acoustic enhancement posterior to the cis and that's again another important useful artifact that helps us to identify cis and like i said enhancement can be seen with any localized clear fluid collection uh, not only with the cis but in kidney most commonly it's cyst and when you find a cyst look for septations calcifications and uh, presence of any echogenic uh, intracystic debris. Here is an example of complex cyst. So, so here you see septations, fibrous septations, which are white here and well-defined. And here you can also see some calcifications. Why do you call them calcifications? See, because like stones, any calcified structure can give shadowing. Here you see enhancement, that is whitish uh, structure posterior to the cyst. But again, here you are seeing shadow from this calcified structure. So here is a complex cyst with septations and calcifications. And the use of ultrasound um, in the Bosnia classification um, is not fully accepted as the detection of uh, neovascularization in malignant lesions, uh, which is indicated by contrast enhancement of solid components or septa. Uh, is fundamental part of the classification. But it is known that ultrasound may demonstrate internal septa better than CT and even MRI. Accordingly, it's been suggested that simple um, and minimally complex, that is Bosniak 1 and 2 cysts, may be followed with ultrasound only periodically. And here is an example of a renal allograft. Renal allograft pretty much looks like a, any, any other kidney. It's just that you have to pay attention to its uh, anatomy. Sometimes it's very close to the bladder. Unless you see all the views, you can easily confuse this with a uh, cyst in one of the poles of the kidney. And uh, the angle might be slightly different depending on where in the pelvis uh, the kidney is. 
And finally, is ultrasound safe? Nobody knows. Ultrasound waves can heat the tissue slightly, and in some cases it can also produce small pockets of gas in uh, body fluids or tissue that's called cavitation. So the long-term consequences of these effects are unknown, and uh, FDA recommends uh, strongly against uh, fetal keepsake videos with those 3D, 4D probes, especially um, unless it's medically reasonable and indicated exam, then you can obtain those pictures as a part of the study. And we follow the principle of ALARA, that means as low as reasonably achievable, which is a safety principle used in radiology uh, designed to minimize radiation doses. Though ultrasound does not use ionizing radiation, it's advisable to minimize unnecessary exposure. Thank you.